Has the world gone crazy? Life is difficult. When you need help, where do you turn? Are you willing? Are you willing to let him blow on the coals of your heart? Are you willing? Are you willing to ignite that flame? To let him blow and ignite that flame? And set you on fire. And set you on fire to consume this county, to consume this state, to consume this world. Welcome. Christian Impact, impacting your life with spiritual truth. I am Dr. Kelly Blanton, and I'm sharing practical truths in the Bible that can truly change your life. Today, June 30th, 2022, we continue with our series, Chronicles of the Kingdom, Lesson 25, The Second Greatest Mystery. There's a second mystery? What is that mystery? Well, let's begin with these questions. Can I really be transformed into a pure and holy kingdom builder? Can I really be part of bringing forth the kingdom of God that actually changes the world? Do I really have a part in this? Or is God going to do it all without me or any other human? What does this have to do with the second greatest mystery? We're going to talk about the second greatest mystery. As we've been continuing our series, I encourage you, if you do not understand the background that I'm referring to, go back and listen to the previous lessons. Uh, this series is building upon each other step by step. And so we've been talking a lot about revelation. And of course, the greatest mystery in the kingdom is the love of God. His love is the power that holds this world, this universe together. It is his love that is the source of all power in the kingdom. Uh, it, it holds all things together. But the second greatest mystery is the means by which the kingdom of heaven is implemented to function and grow on earth. What do I mean by that? How, how is it implemented? Well, we've talked a lot about revelation and about the Word of God. And in the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God spoke, and He created the heavens and the earth. And God spoke, and He divided the waters. And God spoke, and God spoke and created creation. It was the Word of God. And you see that even in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It talks about how the Word made all things. We've also talked about revelation, about receiving the Word of God. The Word of God is a seed in which we receive. And we've talked about hearing the voice of God and, and receiving that revelation. And, and we understand that Sometimes when we're receiving a thought, an idea, a vision, a picture, we're receiving a word from the Lord. He is speaking to us. See, we need to understand that the word of God, it, it is literally like spiritual DNA. It is the genetic code that helps us to function. It holds us together. It's what makes us who we are. It's the Word of God. When God sows His Word, there's this process of receiving and planting. This is the second greatest mystery. That mystery is faith. The second greatest mystery is faith. The process of receiving and planting the Word of God is faith. And as we get into this, we need to understand that when we talk about faith, I'm not talking about wishful thinking. Faith is the ability to bring forth the fruit of the kingdom of God in our lives and the world. And when I say fruit, you can almost think of the production, the implementation, the reality of what God has. Now, there were many parables about seeds and soil and we need to 
rely on those. We need to think about those. Jesus gave us those for a reason. He wants us to understand something about that. In Mark 4.13, Jesus said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to read selected verses 8 through 13, 16 through 18, verse 23. I'm not going to read everything in there because um, I was going to miss the, what I want to emphasize. But for your reference, you want to get it all in context, Matthew chapter 13. But let me, let me read some of these verses. Starting verse, verse 8. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some hundred, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. It's talking about the seed that fell on good ground. And the disciples came to him and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. A little more. Blessed are you, for your eyes see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it. And to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. He who received the seed on good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. See, we must have ears to hear. Not everyone who hears the word of God is really hearing. There's not really understanding is not and because they do not it's it's a mystery it's, it's like it's hidden but it's not hidden Jesus is not here to hide things from us but it does say that he gives us parables so that those who aren't really listening to God can't understand what does that mean? Well, let's just look at the simplicity of the parable of the sower. He's talking about growing plants and planting seeds. And there are so many of us, even in this modern world, who live in cities and stuff, you had grandparents. Parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. They, they had gardens. Maybe you, you even had a farm. And so you have some understanding. We're not totally taken from this, even though we lack a lot of that knowledge that they knew, but we understand you put a seed in the ground and you water it and put some fertilizer. And But you have to understand, you can choose the seed. I want to grow an orange. I want to grow strawberry. I want to grow corn. I want to grow tomatoes. You, you choose the seed that you want and you put them in the ground, but you don't actually grow the plant. Something else grows that plant. Something else has production. And you see, Jesus is trying to bring revelation of the production of the kingdom of God here on earth. How is the kingdom of God produced? How is reality happening? And that's why the second greatest mystery is faith. Because what we need to understand is that faith is that that implements, it produces it brings forth. It is faith. It is a mystery. Faith is a mystery. Because that's why one per two people can hear and one understands and one doesn't. And I know this is controversial because it's like, what do you mean? It sounds really judgmental. You just don't have faith. That's why you can't receive from the Lord. Listen, I'm not talking about something mystical. The Roman says that every person has been given a measure of faith. Every human being on the planet has a measure of faith to believe, to receive from the Lord. That's why we are accountable to God. 
That's why he's going to hold us accountable. That's why when you stand before him in judgment, he holds account. I know there's some theological positions that don't believe that. But how can I truly just God and God is just? That is one of the things the scripture says. God is love. God is just. How can a just God condemn someone for something that he didn't give them? How can you? How can a good God send someone to hell when he made them to burn? They actually fulfilled what he made them for. How is that justice? But justice is that God's given every man a measure of faith. But you see, it's a mystery because that faith must be used. Faith is very much an, an action. And if it's not used, it doesn't produce. You may have faith, but if you don't use that faith, it doesn't it doesn't produce. Suddenly you're here, but you don't hear. You see, but you can't see. It's a strange process. Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 25 says, And he said to them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret that should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. He said to them, Take heed what you hear. For the same measure you use it, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. There's something about hearing and responding to this hearing. Because your response is how you're using your faith. Every day we hear things. Some things we hear and we don't engage with our faith. And that can be a good thing. The world, you turn on the news, there's lies and propaganda and there's stuff that comes through the TVs, through our radios, through music, through people's speech. Not all things we need to extend our faith to. We need to not receive some words. We don't want to receive bad seeds. Again, those are other lessons we covered. But when the word of God is spoken to us, when all of a sudden the word has come to us, we don't want to just hear and nod like we do to everything else. That requires our faith engage it. We need to take what we hear and then use it. For it says, with the same measure you use it, it is measured to you. And you see, sometimes we all cry about, you know, well, I really believed I was going to get healed and, and nothing happened. And now you're saying, I don't have faith. And blah, blah, blah. it's not that you don't have faith. But there's so much about the spiritual that correlates to physical. And I know I've talked a lot about this practicing spiritual disciplines i'm going to get off subject a little bit here but i think i need to i have a lesson in my discipleship about spiritual disciplines and what is a discipline and and it's called a discipline because you have to do something you don't want to do to get results that you want and and the bible talks about that in, 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 in first timothy you know um you know physical physical discipline or physical exercises is, is profitable for little but spiritual godliness is too much gain and what's this what's this about if if you work out if you train you lift weights you do things like that you realize there's a point that you do things as easy and then all of a sudden your body begins to hurt you begin to experience a little pain and you want to quit and successful athletes by the way i'm not a successful athlete but successful athletes understand that it's in that moment of pain that you have to push through the discomfort to actually grow your muscle. Now, that's why you need trainers. That's why athletics train because there's a point where you don't want to hurt your muscle. But there's also a point where you have to push beyond what you think you're capable of to actually get growth. 
you know, we all know this. There's been a lot of cliche sayings. Feel the burn. No pain, no gain. Those, those, those came out of the idea of saying you have to push through some things to actually get muscle growth, to actually get where you're going to go. If you're overweight and you're trying to lose some weight and you're exercising, there comes a point where you're sweating and hurting that you want to stop. But you're not going to lose the weight if you don't push through. I live out by a 7,000-foot mountain. And sometimes going over in the cars, there's a lot of cyclists. And you see cyclists going up the mountain trying to go over it. And I, I see them. And, you know, the fleshy me wants to stick my head out the window and, you know, feel the burn, feel the burn on them. It's sort of funny. But I know going up that hill, I'm looking at them. I can almost feel it in my thighs, the pain that's shooting through those muscles with them on those bikes. Why do they do that? Why do they? It's because there's a goal on the other side. They're willing to push through the pain that's temporary to build their muscle, their stamina, and to reach the other side, to reach goals. Many of the cyclists doing that, they're going on this mountain it's because they're training for other events. Where I live, there's not a lot of cycling competition. So why are they doing so much here? It's, it's about training, it's about preparation. No pain, no gain. Spiritually, there's a parable in that. You have spiritual muscles. They have to be trained. Your faith is like a muscle. It must be trained. If you if you can't use it in little bitty everyday things, you're deceiving yourself when you believe that you can use it for something big. We want to think that we get desperate enough. I'm, I'm sick. I'm ill. I got a relative that's sick and ill. And you've never exercised faith in God for little things. And suddenly you think that your faith will be good enough to bring forth this massive healing of cancer or something. You're deceiving yourself. You don't, you don't, you don't use your faith for little things. You can't use it for big things. It's, it's not there. That sort of miracle almost requires God to intervene himself without your faith and do what he's going to do because there's bigger, higher purposes involved. And I'm not talking about those exceptions. God can always show up and do whatever he wants to do. There's always hope in those aspects. But right now I'm talking about the second greatest mystery, which is your faith in producing the kingdom of God in your life today, tomorrow. So many of us struggle with seeing these things, and it's because we do not want to exercise our faith on little things on a daily basis. We don't want to take heed what we're hearing. With the same measure you use it, it will be measured to you. I know this can be a hard message sometimes to hear, but we need to understand this because, you know, Jesus is the word of God. He is the truth. He is the seed of God. Jesus is the one that's sown into our hearts. He is the one producing life and growing in us. And our faith needs to be in him. If we're going to grow, we need to trust him. We need to allow what he's doing in us to manifest. First John 1, verses 1 through 4, and then verse 10 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him nothing that was made was made. In Him was life, and the life was a lot of men. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, and the world did not know Him. There's a lot of in Him's in there. By him, for him, without him, through him. It's about Jesus. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, For by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or power. All things were created through him and for him. And he does, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. I'm sorry, I stumbled a little bit while reading that. Because i got so much going through my mind. But in him all things 
consist. You know, these, these are scriptures I've already read in earlier lessons, but we're repeating them because we need to get this truth in us that Jesus is the creator of all things. All things is made for him, through him, and he's in us. Jesus is living in us now, and he will produce his plan and rule of God. He will. Jesus has all authority over creation, and he's planted in us. Do you understand that that means if Jesus, the fullness of the deity of God, is living in us through his spirit, that the creator is in you. The power of creation is in you. I can say that the power of creation is in you because the creator himself is living in your heart. And as I say this, remember, don't let the enemy pervert what I'm saying. Do not let the word of the enemy of the world tell you that that makes you a God. That doesn't make you a God. It doesn't make us divine. It should humble us that our creator wants to be with us that intimately. In that type of intimate relationship with us. But we are made in his image. We're made to be vessels that produce. Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, and those are very dark chapters because it talks about sin and how we've all sinned. We've all have fallen short. And there's a scripture that says that man has the, man creates new evil. This sinful man that's given over to sin has the ability to create new evil. I was sharing that in a teaching class not long ago and a student, sometimes the spirit can use students to even teach the teachers. Something boiled up out of him that was just, it was, it was powerful because we brought up this thing about Satan can only pervert and twist in the garden with, with sin, he, he twisted the word. He perverted the word to Eve. And, and, and he constantly twists and perverts, twists and perverts. That's how come when he, he comes to you, there's so much, so much of the devil. There's so much truth in what he says because he's taking the truth of God and then he's putting a twist, a perversion into it that makes the whole thing bad. See, we want to separate. Well, there's a little good in that. If there's a perversion in it, there's truth, yes, but he's perverted it. It's it's, it's fallen. That's what sin does. It, it falls and perverts. But it's interesting because Satan cannot create new evil. But man, can can. Because it's a gift from the mystery of God. That's from our faith. When our faith isn't in God, we produce evil. This student also pointed out, isn't it funny, in Genesis chapter 6, we talk about these, these, these fallen angels that come down and they, they interbreed with women. And there's a lot of teaching. Some of it's not good about the Nephilim. But we were talking about that. And there's a scripture that says angels can't have children. So how do these fallen angels have children with women? Well, the student came up with this brilliant point. It's because God's given to mankind the ability to create. It's been given to mankind to make life. Now, I know it's God that gives the life inside the womb. It's God that's given the soul and, and all that sort of stuff. But, but God, in his creation, in his gift to us, gave us this ability to reproduce. And those angels had to abuse that because they could not create themselves. They could pervert I know some of this is, is sort of kind of out there, but I want us to understand because this all goes back to faith. It goes back to, to faith because faith is that which produces the kingdom of God. It, it, it's, the, it's the thing that, that produces. Do you want to see 30, 60, 100 fold? I 
I'm turning my note page here as I contemplate these things. Because we've been talking about seeds pro producing that living patterns. And they grow in a life. They, they produce these life patterns for us. And we need to receive those seeds. And so many times in daily living, God will speak to us. And I understand there's a difference between the logos, the word of God. We have it in this written form. I understand the ink book is not the logos, but it represents the logos, the word of God. This is the thing that never changes. But then there's things, there's times when God will speak into us. That's his rhema word. And he speaks that into us. And, and I'm always cautious with that because it's really easy for us to begin to think the rhema and the logos is the same thing. And whatever I hear, I can write down. And it's like, no, because you need to take the rhema and compare it to the logos because there's too, there's too many rhemas floating out there. See, there's Satan speaking, there's the world speaking, there's other people speaking, there's your flesh speaking, there's all this stuff speaking. And we always need to take, and all those speaking words, are, that's what rhema is, it's a spoken word. All these rhemas are flowing out there. We need to compare that to the, the logos, the actual word of God that we know and have. But when we're receiving that, that word from God, when God's speaking to us, it, it may come to us as a vision, or a picture, or a thought, or an idea inspiration as his spirit is speaking to our spirit this, these things suddenly enter into us and it's in that moment that's why reading the word that's why being in the word is so important because it'll sound like like God's word but when he does this and, and he speaks into you these things that we need to be able to discern with the spirit of God with the word of God and understand when he's speaking and then put that into action. I want to take what he's speaking and sowing into me. That's why we can sit back and, and say when people say, well, I just don't believe that. Listen, there have been too many miraculous inventions that have helped humankind that have promoted life and good things there are many scientific discoveries where even these old scientists believed in God and they understood this inspiration, this idea, it came from God. He spoke it in. Likewise, there have been many inventions and things that have happened that is from the inspiration from the devil himself that have destroyed, killed, and maimed. Where are we putting our faith? You no, know, Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God is speaking to us because he wants to us for his pleasure. And he wants us to do great things. He wants us to produce fruit. John chapter 15. He talks to us about the vine that doesn't produce fruit. What do you do? Well, you chop it down and throw it into the fire. He desires, he commands us to produce fruit. He wants us to produce fruit. And that process of, of, of planting that seed, when it comes up, it's, it's faith. It's faith. So how do I implement this? How do I do this? I have to begin to put my faith in the word of God. I have to put my faith in that he's in my life. And I have to begin to exercise that faith. Changing the world doesn't mean you suddenly quit your job, you jump a plane and you go somewhere and you raise the dead and, and all that stuff. I mean, that, that if you did that sort of stuff, it, you'd think that'd be world changing, but Changing the world begins when you suddenly just start acting upon the word of God with little things in your life. With little things. Bearing the fruit of using the, the, the first mystery, the love of God, 
oh, the love of God is in me. I'm going to what exercise my faith in this and let that begin to transform you and use that power to show kindness. To begin transforming how you speak and talk. I hear things, talking with people in the world, and I was talking to someone in the business community, and they were talking about employees that gossip and are toxic and poisonous in their environment. And with today's laws, it's, it's hard. In the past, they would just fire someone like that. But instead, they have to keep them around, and how they watch other good employees are poisoned and, and destroyed by workers like that. Listen, there's a lot of toxicity out there. But the love of God can overcome these things. And how can we begin to speak in love and encouragement? How can I begin to exercise my faith? When the, we just came through a pandemic, I tried to encourage people. The power of God is greater than any pandemic. Do not succumb to fear, but have faith. Have faith in the Lord. I understand there were people that passed away. That's what happens when you get illnesses. Yes, people die from COVID, but people also die from pneumonia. They die from the flu. They die from heart disease. They die from diabetes. They die from drunk drivers. They die from shootings. They die, they die from domestic violence. They die from sex trafficking. There, there are many things. They die from STDs. There are many things in the world that kill people. Do not be deceived into fear of a certain thing. No matter what they say about the pandemic, it was not the black plague. You did not see your neighbors lying dead in yards for weeks on ends and no one would haul off their bodies. That's the black plague. We did not see the black plague. But even if we did, guess what? The church survived the black plague. And we need to have faith that God is the one that's taking care of us. He will, what? Provide for our needs. Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things be given to you. We need to put that faith to action. And as you begin to work in the little things, God will give you more. He will increase things. As you begin to believe just for decent health listen i get sick i'm not impervious to things but i'll say this much i have not been sick like other people have been sick i do not get the flu like other people get the flu i don't get colds like other people get the colds because i have faith again i'm not impervious i do get sick but I believe God's going to overcome these things. And I don't focus on the illness. I focus on what God has called me to do. Another controversial thing. I've seen too many ministers of God that retire and die within the year of retirement. And this is going to sound judgmental, but you don't quit God. You don't just say, well, I'm called and I'm going to do this for people. But now... Now that I'm old, I'm going to be selfish and I'm not going to fulfill the call of God and I'm going to go do what I want to do. Listen, either you weren't called to begin with and you were fooling everyone or now you're deceiving yourself and thinking that, God, I'm just not going to work for you anymore. And I believe there's a lot of ministers, they love the Lord. They they do love the Lord and they, they were called, but they allowed the things of the world to tire them out and they begin to believe the Lord that the calling is a vocation. It's a job. And when they quit the calling, they died. They got sick, and within a year, they were gone. Why? If you're not working with God, you're not working with life. You're not looking in abundance. Suddenly, the blessing of life is gone. That's not God killing them. That's them killing themselves. Too many times. Even, you know, even the world picks up on this. I, I know many non-believers that talk about older people that do not have purpose in their life will, will, will die quicker. There are many atheist medical doctors I know that, that, that believe this. They believe that it, without some type of purpose, an older person, when they get to a certain age, will, will die because they have to have purpose in their life. There is no greater purpose in the Lord. His purpose is calling. There's, he made us for a reason, and we need to be about the Father's business. 
just me saying that. Do you understand that these words that I say are called faith? Having the, the reason for being here. That's faith. God made you for a reason. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for today, God, that you're revealing this mystery about faith and purpose. You put us here for a reason. God, I pray that everyone listening to this would, would understand that they have a purpose, they have a reason, God. And I pray that they begin to take those steps of faith, that second greatest mystery that produces your kingdom reality in the world. Father, I pray, God, that you'd well up in boldness in them, like you did that church in Acts, and you'd fill them with boldness to step out and live your word. That They would start it in those small things, God, The Lord, as they do this, that you would transform their life. Yes, that you would transform them into the pure bride that you've called them to be. The God, that as they do this, they will begin to understand they have a part in bringing forth your kingdom. That Lord, even in the little things, they are changing the world. One person at a time. Father, I thank you. You've called us to be world change agents. Help us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to the series Chronicles of the Kingdom. You can listen to all the series at christianimpact.net. We are on a number of different Podcast forums, Spotify, Amazon, uh, Podbean, uh, Samsung. Uh, there's just there's several we're on. I know the quality of sound is different for each one. So if the quality of sound's not real good where you're listening, maybe you try out another one. And again, until next time, God bless. <laughs>